I've got a marvelous introduction with Francesco. He's so gracious. My name is Laura, and I'm here to talk about making previs pop, blending your 2D characters into a 3D world. A little bit about me, I like punching things. I like to dance bachata. I have a bad habit of leading and working on that. And I live in museums. The other thing about me is I love to write. Uh, when I was a kid, I told my parents I want to be a filmmaker when I grow up. And my parents were like, that's adorable. You're going to be an anesthesiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on them. 15 years later, I edit news for a living, and I'm still putting people to sleep every night. <laughs> so I've some, spent 15 years in documentaries, commercial production, and now news. The last 10 years of that have been in editing. And I realized, with a little bit of my background in 3D, because everybody does everything these days, uh, if I learned how to draw, I could break into storyboarding and actually make some progress on all of those unproduced scripts. So I got really serious around lockdown with the illustration and 3D modeling. I saw the most progress when I started tracking that, first with 100 mannequins, and then later 365 days of the Croquis Cafe. Uh, and things essentially look like this now. If I could do that 365 days again, what I would do is I did a lot of sit-down poses. I did a lot of static poses. I would probably do more drawing from cafes as well as photos of people in mid-action. Because as I'm storyboarding now, there's nothing that I want to do more than just put in like an Aaron Sorkin style walk and talk just to liven things up. So it took a couple weeks, if not months, to figure out how to get a lot of good results out of the basic brush and blender. And the basic brush is really important because the projects that I'm working in, in <clears throat> excuse me, have 10,000, maybe 100,000 strokes in them. So as much as I would love to put on texture for a more organic feel, essentially what I need is something that will immediately pop up with every drawing that I'm dropping into the storyboard. So. The goal for me is essentially creating a pre-visual aesthetic that is appealing enough to double as a final product, but efficient enough that I can build it on my own. The NPR community here is absolutely amazing, and I love what everyone is doing, everything from Lightning Boys Ghibli-style backgrounds to Sophie Jantak's animal portraits. I love Wu Chenqing's ink tools, but at the end of the day, I cannot just spend an entire day texturing a tree, I need a workflow that is efficient because I want to work in the writer's room, I want to work with the writers and iteratively help them build their stories to see what is resonating and what is not working. So how do we take this <laughs> and add a little emotion to it? I love layout, but at the end of the day, it's a tool in a pipeline. All of the other departments are looking at layout and adding on top of that. They're using it to understand where their department fits in. So how do we create an environment where sketches will seamlessly blend into the background? I was talking to a woman earlier at the cheese board, and she was like, oh, it's like Roger Rabbit, but like the reverse. And that's it. It's we still have our 2D sketches and a 3D environment, but instead of modifying our 2D sketches to fit into the 3D environment, how do we modify our 3D environment so our 2D sketches will seamlessly integrate? So uh, my journey essentially started studying oneers. Kirsan's got some great oneers. Spielberg has great oneers. I just studied um, James Gunn's Guardian of the Galaxy 2 with this. And this is essentially what grease pencil pre looks like right now. It's a very effective tool. But at the end of the day, you can see that very blocky background. So how do we, how do we make this better? I started using tune shaders and some flat colors, and this is a really effective tool. Um, as I go through these slides, there are a hundred answers to this problem of how do we make an aesthetically appealing, appealing style of previs. So please incorporate any ideas or paths that I went down into your own projects. There are no right or wrong answers, especially as you're working through. So um, characters with color, this is really effective. The benefits of this are there's, it's very clear 
if you're working in high action scenes, giving each of your characters a different color really helps distinguish them as they're moving around. And it's also just very clean. But I was looking for something a little bit more organic, something that felt like it echoed traditional storyboards. So I started playing around with partial transparencies and with textures. So I took a sketchbook out, I took my iPad out, and I just started drawing people. And I took that and I dropped it into Blender as images, as planes. And while I do like the look of this, and I really like that it preserves the sketchy quality of the initial drawings, dropping in images as planes into a storyboard is completely unpractical. <laughs> I would not wish that on my <laughs> most hated enemy. Don't storyboard with images as planes. It's gonna take way too long. And the minute that you start putting in iterative drawings, like a little bit of motion of someone moving or someone walking, just do it in grease pencil. So how do we add a little bit of color to the grease pencil uh, aesthetic? This time I, I took those grease pencils and I started dropping them into the environment, which is a solution. It's an incredibly time-consuming solution, but it is a way of putting in a little bit of color that is the same style as the characters. So one other valuable lesson from this is, uh, as I started working in this more minimal style, I realized how important the ground was. Uh, we're constantly walking and taking in that information and using that to not fall over. So whether you're working in uh, a natural environment, put in some grass, whether you're working in a room, put in a rug, you just need something on the ground for your audience to understand <coughs> where your camera is and what your camera is doing. Was this an effective solution? Could be. For me, it was just a little too much work going through and just custom hand painting things. Uh, speaking of hand painting things, I was like, okay, great, we can take this, and what if we just start automating this in Adobe Substance Painter? I don't like Adobe anymore. <laughs> Sorry to drop that. <laughs> um, what you want to do, what I did with this is I thought like, oh, great, I can like automate this process, I can send it off and use like a lot of their presets to make a really nice ink look on, in this case, the fish, and I believe the rock. And, well, I just ended up doing a whole bunch of custom textures anyway. So all of these were so simple, you can just do them in grease pencil itself or just in Blender itself in your vertex painting. Don't bother leaving the program. Um, from here, I was like, okay, great. We've got enough of a look that we're gonna start moving into multi-camera scenes. So this is a story my friend wrote. I was like, great, I'll take it, take a shot at it. And what you're looking for here is, now that you're working with multi, multiple cameras, what you wanna do is, well, that's a whole tangent. When you're working in an interior, go ahead and take the outline of your room, wireframe it, and get rid of the walls. You are going to lose your cameras, but it's still really nice to have that depth conveyed with like the corners of the room. So from there, I went into an exterior. And the wonderful thing about this is um, it just kind of reminded me of all of these tutorials that we do, thinking they're not gonna go anywhere. What's the point of this useless Saturday morning tutorial? But as you can probably tell, one, I've done a better version of this with better trees, I promise. I just really like the characters in this. Um, but this is a particle system forest, which can now, of course, be done with geonodes, highly recommend. But at the time, it was one of the, I was trying to figure out how to do the forest, and I realized, look, I can just use the same particle system from Martin Kleckner's, I believe these was CG Boost tutorial on environments. And then, of course, that's the same particle system that you all are using to put sprinkles on your donut however many years ago. So. Up next, I've slightly tweaked my workflow in the last year because Gaku Tada released Deep Paint, which is an amazing plugin and an amazing extension that you can use to, let me catch my breath. <laughs> you can use this extension to create, create like exquisite botanicals and ethereal Japanese temples and amazing European architecture. And I use it to make my shadows blue. <laughs> I swear I've made nice things with it too, but it's just so useful and I love that it adds this like blue cast 
this like 1980s previs, like animators previs aesthetic to things. So if you're interested in telling your own stories, the way that I do it is, uh, right now I'm working through a six minute short. You're gonna take your script, you're gonna break it down. You're gonna take out a little micron pen and you're just gonna start ideating on top of it. Go ahead and make little thumbnails of your characters, what they're doing, what's in their heads, underline the important props and furniture, and then go ahead and on the back of one of those pages, uh, just do like a very scratchy overview of what your set is going to be. This way when you open up Blender, you're not looking at a blank page, you know what you need to start modeling, you know what you need to start working on. <coughs> up next, audio. So take your script, break it down, figure out what your lines are, figure out what these characters are. And I worked with Casting Call Club. I absolutely loved them. There's such a breadth of talent with those guys. And I know that AI can do your voiceovers these days. But at the end of the day, like we make things to connect with people. And there's so many voiceover, voice actors that are really excited to work with you. So reach out, connect, collaborate, and work with people. The other important thing with your audio is taking these waveforms that people send you and chopping them up line by line. Uh, because you're going to be rebuilding this in Blender with your music, with your sound effects, it's important to build your radio cut in Blender itself. Because as you're going through with your cameras, you're going to want to like, I wish I'd like extended this shot, no problem at all. Everything's built in Blender, you can just shift things down to allow for that camera movement to breathe. So the way that I work with finding placement in 3D storyboarding is I create these character stands. I used to guess it on the floor. It's very, very hard to go back and modify things if you try to just guess it. Go ahead and create these character stands. And then I put red dots on the clavicle, at the shoulders, and at the shins. And so, most of the time, I'm essentially finding the 3D location of where the character will be through the clavicle dot. But if you have anything that needs parallax into the camera, or if you have any characters sitting down, you're going to find your 3D location for that character in that moment on that shin dot. So go ahead and take these character stands and your cameras, and now your radio cut, and you're just gonna go ahead and start blocking things out. There's a thousand YouTube tutorials on cinematography. Be free, have fun, experiment. Honestly, the best way you learn anything is just by doing it. So, this playing back obviously looks super blocky. It looks like layout. Uh, this was a slightly earlier iteration from this year. You can see there's a little bit of cross hatching that I believe I manually added. You can also do this in the shader tab. You can also experiment with Kirby dots if you like the black and white style, but are trying to create this in a 3D world. So obviously what's next is you go from these blocks to your rough action. So basically going back through, adding in your characters. Again, so much of the way that I got fast at these stick figures was so much uh, life drawing, figure drawing. So practice, 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 practice. Right now, uh, things are essentially looking like this as I'm going through this cleanup pass. I'm adding in a couple more grease pencil layers. I'm able to locate the 3D position of where these characters are because of those character blocks. And I'm adding in white fills and then sketchings on top of that. Um, ultimately, these are really useful for four reasons. I love working in this style because one, it's almost clean enough that I can just drop it on YouTube and just be like, that's it, I'm done, I did a story. Does it work? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. At the end of the day, like shorts turn into features. Whiplash, short, whiplash the feature. The other reason that I stop here is because I can take this to an investor and investors with all of their imagination now have a much better idea of what the story is and what they're investing in. I can also take this, and because it is essentially layout, I can pass it off to other artists down the pipeline. Uh, everyone understands what they're working on and how it ultimately fits into the final compositions. And then the last thing that I can do is I can send this to test audiences, whether they're like writer's rooms or whether they're like 
general audiences, and we can get feedback on what part of the story is working and what part of the story isn't working. I have this theory that I think like early Pixar was so good because the technology was so bad, and they had to work the, uh, workshop their stories over and over and over again because production timelines were so long. They had the opportunity to really figure out what was working in the story and what wasn't. So ultimately, think about your 3D storyboards. They're less like comics or traditional animation, and they're more like plays. You have your set, you have your location, you have your characters, and you're figuring out what to do with what you have. It's amazing because you never have to redraw a background, and you can swap out your cameras instantly. You want to go from an 80 millimeter lens to a 120 millimeter lens, it takes two seconds. There's so much versatility, it is a fantastic skill. But do keep in mind that because you're never opening up your presentation or opening up your project and looking at a blank page, there's a downside to that. The downside is that you're never going to be, well, not never, you're going to forget or could forget montages and really unique transitions. One of my favorite videos that covers this is uh, Satoshi Kon, uh, Tony Zhu's Every Frame of Painting. And you guys all know, of course, the bone that turns into the spaceship. There are so many unique ways of telling a story. These are things that don't come to mind instantly because you're looking at your set, you're looking at your pieces, and you're like, what can I do with what I have? So don't forget about montage and unique transitions. Uh, I guess that's it for me. I just wanna thank you so much for your time. My name is Laura. Uh, if you have any ideas, questions, comments, or ideas, Come talk to me. I'm an extrovert, but I just spend so much time at the computer. Thank you. Mm -hmm.